take it away. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much and sorry for having you all waiting. Well, today me and Kate will give, be presenting a story about extremely low biomass um, uh, fields, which just presents the results, which just seem to go against uh, common sense, like presenting things like in a in, 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 like basically the in utero microbiome, it's like a, the, the biological equivalent of reporting whales flying above the Himalayas. So basically this entire field got uh, started more or less with this particular paper from Kirsty Agard et al, who reported that the, the placenta contains a unique microbiome. So they reported lots of things like lots of environmental bacteria being associated with preterm delivery. And they also combined the supposed placental microbiome with various other mi human microbiomes like oral, vaginal, or fecal microbiome. However, they did not include any negative controls and also they failed to use common sense. Because one of the main things one should be taking into account when looking at extremely low biomass samples or samples with no microbial biomass is the issue of reagent contamination. Now, to explain you the, the concept of reagent contamination, I'd like to give, show you the following picture, which shows you a serial dilution of pure water, which was spiked with Salmonella bongeri. So if you make a serial dilution of this spiked water with Salmonella bongeri, you should expect only to detect Salmonella bongeri, even as you dilute it. However, you will instead start seeing an entire rainbow of other crap appearing. And this other crap is not coming from your spiked water. It's coming from your DNA isolation kit or your PCR kit or perhaps even your sequencing machine. So if you have a sample with a high amount of biomass, it will also suffer a little bit from contamination, but finally in your sequencing data, it will, the, the contamination will not really matter a lot. If, your, if the biomass in your sample is relatively low, then your contamination will make up a large amount of your sequencing data, but it's still pretty easy to figure out what is what, as I'll show later. The problem is if you have no, uh, my, no microbial biomass whatsoever, then basically your entire uh, signal, your da sequencing data will be completely consisting out of reagent contamination and other contaminants. So how do you figure out what are genuine signals and which ones are contaminants? Well, of course, naturally use negative controls and don't be stingy. Also use positive controls to figure out what the actual biomass levels are within a sample. But aside from that, there's other tricks. You, you, you don't even need negative or positive controls to figure out what our contaminants are, but I would certainly use them. But one of the things is look for batch effects. So genuine signals should not be associated with a particular sequencing run or with a particular lot number of a DNA isolation kit. So anything that is associated with a batch effect tends to be a contaminant. Um, you can also, another artificial pattern is often raising contaminants, they are also, uh, often very highly correlated with other reagent contaminants because they are from the same source. So you can use, if you identify a reagent contaminant, you can use that to fish out other reagent contaminants. And you can also use methods like hierarchical clustering to cluster uh, low biomass assess, uh, samples with also, a, they tend to cluster together with one another and with negative controls, and they tend to then be associated with number of uh, microbial signals and so on is in the lower right corner which are reagent contaminants, while samples with high amounts of biomass, they tend to have their own unique, genuine profile. Well, science also furthermore should be reproducible. So if you have a sample and then you to do two separate DNA isolations on it, genuine signals should be reproducibly detectable. Uh, so in this case, the lower right figure, uh, Moraxella. However, if your signal is coming from your PCR kit, let's say, then if you do these two different DNA isolations, you will get an uncorrelated uh, blob of uh, of signals. Um, of course, reproducibility can also be in the form of doing both 6 ns and whole genome sequencing and um, other ways. Or if you're really um, convinced about a particular signal, then you should be able to verify it using like a species specific qPCR or a species species specific fish. And lastly, but not least, is to use ecological knowledge. Use your common sense and you'd be surprised how uh, infrequently common sense is nowadays used. For example, would you believe that you have a brain microbiome, which amongst others contains photosynthetic bacteria, probably because you are so very bright, or that you might become schizophrenic because of your blood microbiome, which amongst others amazingly contains also photosynthetic bacteria and thermophiles and chemolithoautotrophic bacteria. Or that if you look at breast tissue samples, that Canadian breasts are completely different from Irish breast tissue samples, and that Irish breasts actually contain hysteria well, I'm not buying it. Um, so 
in my first Nature publication, uh, we reported also on the placental microbiome, actually reporting that it does not have a placental microbiome. So when we analyzed tons and tons of placental tissue samples, we detected tons and tons of signals. However, almost all of these signals were reagent contaminants. Only in like 5% of samples, we did we detect a genuine signal, Streptococcus agalatia, group B strep. And we also verify this by quantitative qPCR. And perhaps in one in 500 samples, we contain listeria. But all of the other signals were either uh, uh, vaginal delivery contaminants or skin contaminants from a C-section delivery, or even more, more commonly DNA kit isolation contaminants or reagent kit contaminants, and even contaminants from the sequencing facility itself. For example, in our whole genome sequencing data, we found fibril cholera hanging around. Well, I can assure you there's no fibril cholera in any of the placental samples. However, at the Sanger Institute at the time, they had a project on samples from Bangladesh where they studied fibril cholera. So that's also pretty clear where that came from. And actually, since it's whole genome sequencing data, you can actually find that the closest match was this sequencing project from uh, Bangladesh. Now, um, if typically, if you have a reagent con a contamination, if you want to correct for it, most commonly people just use negative controls and then subtract the negative controls from, from their samples to figure out what the genuine signal is. So this tends to work if you, if you have low biomass samples, because those low biomass actually contain a genuine signal. So you can either use negative controls to figure out what is real, but you can actually even just look at the contaminant, uh, the, the ratio of all, of all your signals to figure out which signals are the which are the contaminants. So, but of course, use both negative controls and use statistical tricks to figure out what your genuine signals are and what reagent contamination signals are. So, if you do use all of the tricks, so you you look for batch effects, you look for uh, correlations between con contaminants. And you look and you use negative controls, and it's very easy to figure out in low biomass samples what the genuine signals are and what the reagent contamination signals are. Well, perhaps very easy. Like skin microbiomes are pretty tough, as some of the signals over there are both genuine and uh, reagent contamination. However, if you have an extremely low biomass sample or a no biomass sample, then just using negative control simply doesn't cut it anymore because you'll detect stuff in your controls, you'll detect stuff in your samples, and if you subtract things, well, you often still be left with things, but which also tend to be uh, contaminants. So just to show you an example, well, we've been making a lot of fun of other people. So this particular paper uh, in, in, in Nature reported that there was an utero colonization of meconium, and we uh, wrote a letter to Microbome saying, well, we also first wrote a letter back to the original uh, journal. They didn't want to have it. So we went to Microbome instead, and they were very glad to have it. In any case, they, one of their main uh, signals that they found in their meconium was that um, OTU number 10 over left was a genuine signal, or so they say. So they could actually see it in the sequencing data. They said they could visualize, visualize it using microscopy, and they could uh, also even culture it. However, OTU number 10, as you can see, was mainly detected in batch number one and almost not in batch number two. Batch number one, however, only had meconium samples, but uh, no controls in there, whilst batch number two uh, contained both samples and controls. Well, as a result, it indeed appeared like uh, uh, OTU number 10, Micrococcus, was indeed more present in meconium samples, so it was like, seemed like a genuine signal. But if you then take the batch effect into account, you basically conclude the opposite. Oh, in regards to their visualization efforts, so in the picture on the right is from their paper, which shows ball-like shaped structures. And But if you, however, superimpose an actual image of Micrococcus lutease on top of this image, you can see that, uh, well, whatever they visualized was not Micrococcus. And finally, uh, they actually said they managed to culture Micrococcus lutease. So that is their micro 36 in this picture in the lower right. However, if you just solely look at the V4 region, this region that they sequenced, and then you look at the OTU number 10, OTU number 10 uh, differs like seven base pairs with, with, their, actually, with, with their culture Micrococcus luteus. So an OTU number 10, uh, it's actually not even a Micrococcus. It's, it doesn't even have a cochoid shape. So even if, from a phonological perspective, uh, simply this didn't cause the mustard. And now I would like to, to give uh, the presentation over to Kate. So another paper that came out in 2021 um, proposed that they had 
had detected a fetal microbiome as well. And they collected samples from second trimester terminations. Um, and the thing about those samples is that that procedure involves hours of going through labor or it can, and that means that those samples are exposed to the vaginal microbiome before they are collected. Um, and I'd like to just say that it was really important for both of these papers that we ended up writing letters to that they provided all the original data that allowed us to reanalyze it and find some of these inconsistencies. Um, so for this paper, they suggested that when they looked at all of these different sample types, the fetal samples were different from PBS negative controls. So this is just a plot of Ray Curtis dissimilarity. Um, but in this case, I made this plot from their data, uh, re redoing some of their analyses and colored one of the particular batches in red, where you can see that if we look at the same data on a PCOA, the gut samples in yellow from this particular batch are quite different from the gut samples from other batches that they looked at, um, particularly from other batches that included negative controls for operator contamination or environmental contamination. And this particular batch only included one reagent contamination negative control in addition to those PBS negative controls. And when we take that batch out, um, the difference in the gut samples from PBS samples disappears. And those gut samples are now not different from PBS negative controls. However, the placental samples and the skin samples are still different. And this is because again of that sampling contamination from the vaginal microbiome, we think. So to avoid that vaginal microbiome contamination, uh, I was involved in a study where we collected fetal meconium during breech cesarean deliveries so that we could collect um, that sample without contamination from vaginal microbes or from manipulation of the child if it was not a breech delivery. And what we found when we looked at a similar analysis, so here we have the distance between negative controls and other negative controls. And when we compare that, to the distance between fetal meconium samples and negative controls, there's no difference. Whereas neonatal meconium, marked neo at the bottom there, which we collected as first pass, sorry, first pass meconium after birth, as well as infant samples are different from those negative controls. And that's true across all of the comparisons that we can do here, where those fetal meconium samples were indistinguishable from negative controls. And so in our perspective paper, I did a reanalysis looking at the relative abundance of um, the most important genre across these three studies. Um, ours, which was, had those breech cesarean deliveries, as well as Mishra et al. and Rakitaita et al., which had the vaginal deliveries. And you can see that from our study with the cesarean deliveries, there are far fewer contaminants overall. And particularly, we're missing those vaginal microbes at the top of this graph. And so I think from these data and these reanalyses, we can conclude that there's no fetal microbiome in healthy pregnancies. We know that infection does occur, but that's a minority of cases and is not a microbiome. However, that doesn't mean that the maternal microbiota have no effect on fetal development. Um, we know that there are microbial metabolites and antigens that cross the placenta and that those can impact fetal immune development as well as gut development. So I'd like to wrap up by um, having a few acknowledgements. There have been a lot of people involved in, in this particular project. And I am going to um, put up all of our authors list because there's quite a few and it's impossible to go through everyone. And thank you for listening.